So let's look now at how the amounts of oxygen and a decrease in the amount of oxygen in the circulating blood is detected. So here we have the uh, aorta and the aorta has an arch after it leaves the left ventricle. And uh, of course this is, the, this is the right side and this is the left side. Always looking at someone else's anatomy. So for, first of all, there's a, there's a branch, there's a large artery comes off here, branching off the aorta. That's called the, the brachiocephalic uh, trunk. And that goes on. But there's a branch leaves this that goes up to the brain. And that is the right common carotid artery. So we have the carotid artery there. And then round about here, we've got the left common carotid artery as well. And these are the big arteries that we can palpate in the neck. So right common carotid artery, left common carotid artery. Now, why are we calling it the, uh, the common? Because as we know, it bifurcates into two. So th this is going to bifurcate into two. So we have the internal carotids, and it's the same on both sides. So that's the internal uh, left carotid, that's the internal right carotid, that's the external right, and that's the external uh, left. So it's the internal that goes straight on it into the brain. And actually there's a bit of a swelling there called the, uh, the carotid sinus, where the uh, pressure receptors are located. Um, but anyway, for, for the purposes of this talk, we're not particularly interested in those. What we are interested in is the carotid bodies. Now, the carotid bodies are areas of tissue literally just here in the bifurcation of the carotid arteries. They are the carotid bodies and they get a blood supply directly from the uh, external, certainly from the um, external carotid. I think maybe some from the internal carotid as well, but they get the blood supply directly from the, this area of the, of the carotid arteries. So they are sampling the blood that is going through the uh, carotid arteries. And of course, this is going to the brain here. So absolutely vital to maintain brain oxygenation at appropriate levels. And these carotid bodies contain sensors that detect if the amount of oxygen in the blood drops. They detect low levels of oxygen in the blood. In other words, they're hypoxemic detectors. They're stimulated when the amount of oxygen in the blood drops. And likewise, in the arch of the aorta, there's other areas of similar detectors, and these are called the aortic bodies. And again, these will detect lower levels of oxygen in the blood. But the main, the main ones are here in, in the carotid bodies, the main oxygen lack detectors. Now, having said that these detect oxygen lack, well, th that's absolutely true. And having said that uh, this area detects uh, hydrogen ions and increased carbon dioxide, absolutely true. But we've also recently discovered that these areas will respond to some degree to increases in carbon dioxide. They will respond to some degree to increases in the concentration of hydrogen ions, but they respond primarily to oxygen lack. They are oxygen lack detectors. And these oxygen lack detectors send them impulses off up to the brain. So there's nervous connections, sensory nervous connections, they're going up to the brain, to the medulla oblongata, in fact. So leaving the carotid bodies, we actually have sensory branches of the ninth cranial nerve do you remember which nerve is the ninth cranial nerve? That's the glossopharyngeal nerve. So sensory fibers from the glossopharyngeal nerve going up to the brain. And leaving the aortic bodies, we have sensory fibers here going up also to the brain, also to the medulla oblongata. But these are branches of the 10th cranial nerve, which you'll remember as the vagus nerve. So sensory branches of the vagus nerve going up here. And these glossopharyngeal branches and these vagal branches go to the inspiratory center in the medulla oblongata. And of course, this is bilateral. So there's cranial nerves are always in pairs. 
So there's glossopharyngeal nerves on the right side and the left side, or a glossopharyngeal nerve on the right side, a glossopharyngeal nerve on the left side, a vagus nerve on the right side, a vagus nerve on the, uh, on the left side, taking the impulses up to the brain. But all those feed into this vital centre here, this rhythmicity centre. And where there's oxygen lack, that's going to stimulate this centre. So the lower the amount of oxygen in the aortic bodies and the carotid bodies, the more nerve impulses these are going to generate. There'll be more nerve impulses going to the brain saying, hey, we're becoming hypoxic. Hey, we're becoming hypoxic, we're hypoxemic. And the more hypoxemic we become, the more impulses will go up. So eventually these are essentially screaming at the brain saying, we're hypoxemic, get us more oxygen. And that impulse is all going to, those impulses are all going to via the glossopharyngeal and the vagus inputs into the rhythmicity centre and the inspiratory centre saying, breathe harder, breathe deeper, breathe harder, breathe deeper. We're short of oxygen, get more oxygen in. So let's just take a step back. What are we saying? Well, ventilation is normally generated by the rhythm, the rhythmicity centre. But when there's an increase in carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions, that's going to increase the activity. When there's a decrease in oxygen, that's going to increase the activity of this, sending more impulses down the ventral nerve roots to the respiratory muscles, breathe deeper, breathe faster, get more oxygen in, get more carbon dioxide out. Well, that was quite exciting. And as you can see, my... Um, Heart rate has increased a bit, so my heart rate is now uh, 75 beats per minute now, that's okay, and my oxygen saturation is 97. Now I'm not, not going to do this because I can't do it, but um, there's actually quite a cruel uh, streak to my nature, and what I've done to students many times during this sort of lesson is I've put an oxygen saturation probe on them and said, right, your oxygen saturations are 98 now, that's absolutely fine. What I want you to do is drop your oxygen saturations. Drop your oxygen saturations for me, please. So of course, to drop your oxygen saturations, you have to stop breathing. I'm not saying this is commendable. I'm not sure I recommend it. Um, I did supervise them very closely. And uh, students would take a breath and they'd take a breath and the oxygen saturations would stay the same. Sometimes even go up, uh, but they'd stay the same for ages until eventually the oxygen saturations would still be 98 and then they would start breathing again. They would be so desperate to breathe. They would, they would be absolutely desperate to breathe when the oxygen saturations were still uh, 98. Um, now, the reason that they were so desperate to breathe, despite having perfectly normal oxygen saturations, was because the prime impulse to breathe more when, when you've been holding your breath is not the lack of oxygen. It is the increase in carbon dioxide it's the hypercarbic or the hypercapneic drive which simply forces you to breathe again now having said that i did have one student once um this is after many years of trying who actually dropped her saturations it gave me a bit of a fright actually i ordered her to breathe immediately but she could actually hold her breath till she dropped her saturations some people can but um Basically, the, this hypercarbic, hypercapneic drive kicks in and says, no, 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 get, get breathing. Sends impulses down here. She says, come on, let's, we need to breathe here. We need to get rid of this carbon dioxide. We need to get rid of these hydrogen ions. Start blowing them out. So let's look now at how these uh, nerve impulses uh, work. So what happens is these are going to go down the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is, is continuous here, isn't it? So let's imagine that this is the spinal cord here. So here we have the, uh, the spinal cord going down there like that. Now, um, I've drawn this a bit thinner. This is actually continuous there with the medulla oblongata. Now, in the spinal cord, first of all, we have eight uh, cervical nerves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that there would be a C8. Then let's do it a different color. Then we have uh, we have twelve thoracic nerves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And of course, it's the same on the other side. This is, this is uh, 
we've got eight on this side. Eight's a vital on this side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the eighth there. Then we've got the thoracics on this side as well. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So we've got these nerves here. Now, let's do the intercostal nerves first because um, there's no surprises here. Now that's a T1 nerve there. Thoracic uh, nerve root one, that's T1. And what that does is it curves round the relevant intercostal space, the first intercostal space, innervating the first intercostal muscle. And this curves round the second intercostal space, T2. That nerve is T2. Innervating the second intercostal space, the muscle in the second intercostal space. Then this goes round again, that's T3, and that's going to stimulate the intercostal muscle in the third intercostal space. Don't think I need to go on. This goes all the way down to, to T11. So the intercostal nerves stimulate the intercostal muscles in the relevant uh, intercostal space. T1 stimulating the intercostal muscle in the first intercostal space, T2 the intercostal muscle in the second intercostal space, and T3 the intercostal muscle in the, uh, the third intercostal space, all the way down to T11. And if we think about a rib there, so there's a rib, that's bone of course, and the intercostal nerve uh, lies just below the rib there for protection it lies just below the rib and that would be uh, that would be the next rib down there it's a bit of a space and, and then th this area will be intercostal muscle so the relevant intercostal nerve lies just underneath the above the nerve above so suppose this was the uh, fourth intercostal space here then that would be a t4 if that's the fourth intercostal space that would be t4 there now um, it's important to know about because whenever we need to do a thoracosynthesis, putting a needle into the thoracic cavity or putting a chest strain, you need to feel that rib and go in just above that rib there. Um, so you're not damaging the intercostal nerve, which is below the, the, the rib. So anyway, that, that story is not too surprising. Everything coming off at the appropriate level. We expect this in, in the arrangement of the nervous system, really. But when we come to the diaphragm, it's positively weird. So we've got, uh, well, it's not weird, it's absolutely amazing and brilliant. So we've got C1, T, C2, C3. Now it's uh, C3, 4, and 5. Of course, the same on both sides. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 3, 4, C, C3, C4, C5. So the third cervical nerve, the fourth cervical nerve, and the fifth cervical nerve. These go all the way down here, um, past the ribs, to the bottom of the uh, thoracic cavity here. And of course, at the bottom of the thoracic cavity, we've got this diaphragm. So the diaphragm's way down here. There's your diaphragm down there. And these C345 nerves innervate the diaphragm on the relevant side. Tell the diaphragm to move. Innervate the diaphragm. Um, so C345, keep the diaphragm alive, is the, is the rhyme. And this is quite amazing, really, because can you see, if you get um, an injury and you injure your spinal cord any, anywhere any, anywhere below here, really. Um, in fact, uh, um, I, I, I've, I've got a friend who's got um, neurology at the level of uh, C4, and uh, his diaphragm is kept moving by C5 and to some extent uh, C4, even without C3. So injury to all that area there if the nerves that supply the diaphragm left, as you would expect down here from, from uh, T12 or even L1, as you would expect, 
then the patient would stop breathing and, and they would die with, with upper spinal cord injury. But it's quite possible to get embarrassment to the upper cord that then recovers. But all that time you can breathe on the upper nerves because C3, 4, 5 keep the diaphragm alive. And um, these nerves here, going down each side, are the phrenic nerves. The phrenic nerves. Phrenic means to do with diaphragm. This is where we get the term schizophrenia from because the, the Greeks thought the mind was uh, largely in the, in the diaphragm. Split, split diaphragm, schizophrenia. Um, but just remember that these are the phrenic nerves and they come off from C3, 4, 5. Quite an amazing defence mechanism built into the very anatomy of the body.